Right. So we are in the middle of proving the regularized quantum action principle in dimensional regularization, which is basically the statement that the path integral as implicitly defined via dimensionally regularized Feynman diagrams has an invariant measure under any infinitesimal symmetry or field transformation phi goes to phi plus delta phi. And uh, let us immediately jump to the proof. Oh, uh, that, that looks as if it could be a permanent. Let us go to the proof. So we assume uh, that even on the regularized level for d unequal to 4, that the theory and the Feynman diagrams are described by a Lagrangian. That is really the point of the whole thing. A d-dimensional Lagrangian. L D, which has the usual form, namely it has a free part L0 plus an interaction part L int, and the free part L0 has also the usual form in this schematic notation. It looks like this, uh, one half phi i differential operator phi j. And the differential operator is now defined also in d dimensions, so it might contain d dimensional derivative operators and so on. And this is a symbolic notation uh, with appropriate obvious modifications. You can write it also for fermions and so on. And then, uh, even in d dimensions, um, the following is fulfilled namely, if we have a propagator Feynman rule for a field phi i going to phi j, which uh, would be the following green function in the free theory of the time ordered product of phi i phi j Fourier transformed, then this is equal to i times this p tilde um, j i in this case, which is the inverse of the differential operator, namely d tilde i j times p tilde jk is given by Kronecker delta ik. So the propagator uh, corresponding to lines in Feynman diagrams on the reg regularized level is the inverse of the d-dimensional differential operator. So here this is the d-dimensional thing and the propagators are then also defined in d-dimensions. And this relationship is the basis of the regularized quantum action principle and it holds in uh, dimensionally regularized Feynman graphs. Anyway, that is our assumption. And uh, now let us write down the statement. This is the statement and what we need to do is to translate the statement into regularized Feynman diagrams. And uh, therefore, we need a notation for all order Feynman diagrams. And the notation that I'm going to use is basically the operator notation for operators in the interaction picture, where we have free field operators uh, and where we have this weak contraction between different operators. In this way, we generate in the usual way Feynman graphs and we can have a notation for sets of graphs. So the left hand side would be this, zero. And uh, uh, okay, let us prove it for a special case. Uh, so let me, let me write this down. Um, proof for the case where this functional f is just a product of elementary operators phi one up to phi n. That is really uh, the um, only thing that is uh, relevant and then what is to be shown is the following at all orders and so let us show it at one specific order namely at the order of the interaction Lagrangian to the power capital N. 
and n is an arbitrary number. Then on the left hand side we have 0 and on the right hand side we have the following. We have first of all the variation of this functional which corresponds to the sum of all terms where one of the fields gets a delta. So this is this thing here sum over k equal 1 to n uh, of the following. Namely, we have a green function of phi 1 and so on. And then at some point, we have delta phi k instead of phi k. And it goes on up to phi n. Okay, So uh, there will be something more, but just so that you understand. This object arises uh, from the variation of uh, the product of field operators. And there is a sum of as many terms as there are operators. And in each uh, term, one of them gets a delta. So this is this. And now I want to use this operator language in the interaction picture, where uh, this corresponds to um, uh, the gelman low formula, where we have here an exponential of e to the i times l int. And one, now we need n powers of l int, so we get here n factors of the following kind, namely i times integral over l int, and so on. And again, i times integral over l int. And so there are n such factors. n such factors. And this arises from the exponential e to the i times l int. And from this exponential, we also get 1 over n factorial. So this is the nth order term from the exponential function. And uh, it generates green functions corresponding to those fields with one of them uh, with a delta variation. So that is the term coming from this delta f. And now we have to write down the second term, where we have just the functional multiplied with uh, delta l. So plus, um, OK, let's write it down. The functional is just unchanged, phi 1 up to phi n. And then we have this delta L. And the delta L is now split into two terms, namely delta of the free Lagrangian plus delta of the interaction Lagrangian. Let us begin with delta of the interaction Lagrangian. So then uh, from here, we get i times integral of delta L int. Okay. This is one out of these terms from here. And then uh, this would be the green function that we need. And uh, then here there will, will be the exponential of e to the i times l int. Now we already have one factor of l int. Therefore, from the exponential function, we only need the term of the order n minus 1. So we get 1 over n minus 1 factorial. And then we get l minus 1 factors like this, i times l int and so on, i times L int. So these are now n minus 1 factors. Whereas in the previous line, it was n factors. But then, because of that, in combination, the second line is also of nth order in the interaction Lagrangian. Then finally, we have the same thing, but with a variation of the free Lagrangian. So phi 1 up to phi n. Then here, i times the variation of the free Lagrangian. And then again from the exponential function, powers of the interaction. And now we need again n powers of the interaction. So we have here i times integral l int and so on up to i times integral l int. And these are again n factors, n such factors. Okay. And then you see that each of the lines corresponds to a term with n powers of the interaction Lagrangian with the appropriate factorial term coming from the exponential series e to the i times l int. 
and uh, it generates the Feynman diagrammatic expression of the green functions for uh, this expression, then for that expression times this, and for that expression times that. And the path integral formula tells us that the whole thing should be zero. And now what we have to prove is that it actually is zero in dimensional regularization when we interpret all three lines as represented by actual Feynman diagrams in D unequal to four. So in order to uh, do that, we will have to look at the third line. The third line is the most complicated one. And we will look at the Feynman diagram expression for the third line. And we will see that the third line itself gives rise to several different kinds of terms. One term cancels the first line. One term cancels the second line. And another term is 0 on its own. And then we see that the sum of the three lines actually is 0 which is what we want to prove. Okay. So let us go to the third line and look at it. And uh, at the end, as I said, we will recover that the uh, third line subtracts the first and second line. So third line. In the third line, we have the free Lagrangian, about which we know this one here. And so we have to evaluate the variation of the free Lagrangian delta L0. What is the variation of the free Lagrangian? The free Lagrangian is bilinear in the field uh, in a symmetric way. So the one half cancels. And we simply get delta phi i times differential operator in d dimensions times phi j. So that is the variation of the free Lagrangian. And this expression goes here. And uh, just for you to memorize, this delta phi might be even something complicated. It might be a product of fields. It might be a product of the electron and photon field or something like this. This can be a composite operator. can also be simple, but it may be complicated. OK, so then this third line is the following. 1 over n factorial. And uh, then we have here the following phi 1 up to, let me highlight the phi k. And then let's go on up to phi n. Then we have i times the integral of delta phi i d in d dimensions i j phi j and then i times interaction Lagrangian i times interaction Lagrangian and that's it. And uh, this is interpreted as an operator expression. So every phi that stands here is an operator in the interaction picture. So that is a free field operator in the sense of quantum field theory one lectures, which has a known representation in terms of creation and annihilation operators, which acts in a known way onto the vacuum, and which has completely explicitly known commutation relations with everything else. And then we have seen in quantum field theory one how to evaluate such an expression, namely in terms of weak contractions. Namely, there must be a pairing between uh, two field operators each time because creation and annihilation operators have to match up. And so therefore, uh, one evaluates this by using this uh, bracket notation in terms of weak contractions. And now what we need to look at is we have to ask ourselves, what are the possible weak contractions of this particular field operator phi j? What are the possibilities uh, that we can weak contract phi j with? There are three kinds of possible weak contractions of the phi j. Let's highlight the three kinds of weak contractions of phi j. 
The first one would be to WIC contract it with something inside of the delta phi i. Delta phi i might be a product of other field operators, so there can be weak contractions between this and any operator inside of that. That is the first possibility, and I call this collectively possibility A. Second possibility, we can have a weak contraction of phi j with any of the free fields over here at the beginning of the green function. I have highlighted already phi k, so let's contract phi j with that phi k, which is one of the external fields of uh, the green function. And uh, that will be called weak contraction type B. And finally, we can, of course, weak contract phi j with anything here in the interaction Lagrangians. So we have to highlight one of them. Let's say the first one, and then inside of this L int, there may be many products and sums of field operators, and we can recontract with any of them. And collectively, that will be possibility C. And now we have to investigate all three kinds of weak contractions, and we will match them with what we have here. And as I already said many times, the sum will be zero. So we need to look at this in individually, and uh, let us start with A. So the weak contraction of the phi j with anything inside of delta phi i. So the point here is, let's say, this is a Feynman diagram of the following structure. Phi j sits at a certain space-time point. Delta phi i is maybe a product of some field operators at the same space-time point. Therefore, whatever in detail that might be, it will give a line from the point to itself. So here there is the field operator phi j at this space-time point, and anything inside of delta phi i is at the same space-time point, and therefore we have this line connecting a point with itself, a so-called tadpole diagram. And uh, so this gives rise to a loop integral, here a loop momentum p, uh, which is just integrated over because by momentum conservation this loop momentum is totally undefined, and therefore we get a loop integration over this line's momentum in momentum space. And what is the integrand of this loop integral? The integrand is, of course, the value of this line times the value of the remaining integrand, and the remaining integrand is this here, namely the differential operator. But what is, so let's say we get this structure, d-dimensional loop momentum, over the combination of the differential operator in momentum space, ij, times the propagator, i times p tilde j k to anything here inside of that. But what is this? The product of the two in momentum space is just Kronecker delta i k times i in this case, Kronecker delta i k, but it is a constant. And now you have to know that in dimensional regularization, a loop integral over a constant is defined to be zero. That is a property of dimensional regularization. Of course, uh, in normal mathematics, this is infinite. But in dimensional regularization, it is defined to be zero as a so-called scaleless integral. In dimensional regularization. So therefore, the big contractions of type A, they give zero. Okay, now the more difficult and interesting cases. So what are the results for the weak contractions of type B? In other words, from the field phi j to one of the external fields. So here we have the following kind of structure. The interesting factors are this one, so phi k. Then we have here an integral i times delta phi i times the differential operator 
I J phi J and this here is Wick contracted. So what is that actually? What it actually is, is uh, this Wick contraction gives us a propagator Feynman rule so we can literally evaluate it. So we have here the integral delta phi i times differential operator d i j in d dimensions and then this weak contraction gives us i times the propagator p j k. All right, and so we can evaluate it either in position space or in momentum space. In momentum space, it's a Kronecker delta. In position space, it's a Kronecker delta times a delta function of the position arguments x i minus x j. And so in the end, this combination here cancels exactly uh, the integration here over this position space variable and the position space variable is replaced by the position of the field operator phi k. So what we get is i times delta phi uh, k, delta phi k, but now we have to watch out for the i's, namely this i times that i gives a minus one. So we get exactly delta phi k. at x k, at the appropriate argument. If that is the argument x k, then at the end we get minus delta phi k at x k. Okay, so if you look at this, what that means, the big contraction of type B just replaces the first round bracket and the phi k in total by minus delta phi k and then compare it please with the first line here. That's exactly the first line up to the minus. We have here delta phi k and all these powers of the interaction Lagrangian. That is exactly what we have over there, except for the minus and therefore as announced, the weak contraction type B cancels exactly the first line. Even the one over m factorial matches. So that cancels the first line. As simple as that. And similarly it works for the last case. So the last case uh, gives us the following x served i times the integral delta phi i differential operator i j phi j and then uh, i times integral l int. And the phi j is weak contracted with something inside of the l int. So what that means is the following, first of all, before we can write down the V contraction phi j. So here, let's say you need to extract one field operator, let's call it phi l, out of the l int. And so that means that we basically take here the functional derivative of the l int with respect to some field operator phi l times phi l we sum over all possible field operators and then this extracts uh, the various types of possible field operators out of this L int. So this is the more explicit way to write the previous line. And then we exhibit the possible V contraction of phi j with any possible field operator type inside of the L int. Okay, and then this is again the propagator, which is the inverse of the differential operator. Therefore, the product of the two just gives an i times uh, the Kronecker's between all the indices. Therefore, together with this i, we get a minus sign. And what remains is then delta phi i times uh, overall the indices give us uh, uh, i becomes l and then times 
the functional derivative of i times l int with respect to phi l. And this combination is nothing but minus the overall variation of the interaction Lagrangian. That's exactly what we would call the variation of the interaction Lagrangian. And so you see that overall the interesting factors out of this contraction C give rise to minus delta L int. And then all of those factors here that you see are replaced by minus delta L int. And that cancels the second line here. Cancels the second line here because of the minus. And uh, the i works out because we have n factors of i there and n factors of i here. The n minus 1 factorial works out because we have n different possibilities of choosing a factor of l int for this manipulation here. So we get a factor of n which makes the 1 over n factorial into 1 over n minus 1 factorial. So in the end, this cancels uh, the second line. And that completes the proof. That is the proof of the regularized quantum action principle in dimensional regularization. And so many items of the proof are combinatorical and simply uh, carefully assessing which diagrams exist. But uh, um, important uh, detailed properties of the regularization which enter the proof and which are maybe not so obvious are that the regularization, dimensional regularization, has the property that the regularized Feynman diagrams and Feynman rules are in direct one-to-one -one correspondence to the d-dimensional Lagrangian. And that is the reason that we can do all these manipulations and use in the rearrangements a d-dimensional differential operator and a d-dimensional Lagrangian. So this property is the key to establish uh, this quantum action principle. And this is a special property of dimensional regularization, which is not shared by all regularizations, because uh, regularization in general is something where you write down a divergent Feynman diagram and you change it in order to make it convergent. And uh, it's not necessarily the case that the change you do corresponds al already to a change in the Lagrangian. But in this uh, case here, it does, and that is why we have this relationship. And I want to remind you of the comment that we already made last week, namely about anomalies. Anomalies are not our main topic here, but it, it fits, and uh, the comment was already made last time, so it's appropriate here as well. There is the possibility of uh, so-called symmetry <coughs> breakings by quantum effects, where you have a Lagrangian in the classical theory, also in four dimensions, of course, which is invariant under a symmetry. And then you quantize it. You uh, define the quantum theory corresponding to it uh, by, for example, the path integral or by canonical quantization. And the full definition of a theory, of course, involves not only writing down the path integral, but also renormalization and regularization and taking uh, the limit to a convergent uh, final theory. And depending on how you do it, what can happen is that the path integral measure might be not invariant under a symmetry. And then uh, the quantum theory doesn't share the symmetry of the classical theory. But here, uh, what we have shown is that the measure here is always invariant under everything. But it can happen that you are not able to extend your four-dimensional classical Lagrangian to a d-dimensional Lagrangian, which still shares the same symmetry. And then this, again, reflects the symmetry breaking by the process of regularization and renormalization, such that the feature of anomalies is something which is independent of the detailed procedure that you do. But it manifests itself in different ways. All right. So this ends our chapter one of the lecture. Um, and uh, afterwards, we will go on with something else. But maybe there are questions. Yes, that is completely independent, but uh, in, yeah. 
Right, of course, the science would have to be tracked and that might be laborious and I would not like to do it, but uh, that of course works out. Yeah, that is right. And uh, in fact, maybe that is a worthwhile comment also. Uh, we did not discuss at all the path integral of fermions and there is an entire uh, long discussion that one could do about path integral uh, of fermions and in general integrals of fermionic Grassmann variables but I would skip that and refer you to textbooks. Um, there is nothing, uh, I think, of um, which changes our, um, uh, the remainder of the lecture this semester, which would depend on a detailed discussion of that. So for our purposes, one can say uh, there are obvious modifications, just flipping some signs, but everything else works in the same way. Are there other questions to path integrals or uh, what identity or, uh, uh, yeah. Sorry, the contraction in A that you mentioned where you contract the phi J with the delta phi I, why does this also give the same propagator when, as if you do the other contraction where you contract phi J with phi K? Because you stated over there that this delta phi I can be something maybe composite or complicated. Mm -hmm. And why can we also take the normal propagator for the <laughs> It is the same as here, where uh, we have a contraction between phi j and any of the operators inside of L int. So if that is a product, uh, I assume it is a product or a sum of products, then you extract out of the product one factor and you contract it with this factor and multiply with the rest. That is this notation here. And the same thing uh, would be true also in this case, uh, but I didn't write it in such an explicit form. But you just take one factor out of this delta phi and you contract this with that uh, field that you have selected. But whatever field you select, this thing will remain true. The only thing that is integrated over is a constant. Because the other factors that you do not select for the V contraction, they are independent of this momentum. Therefore, what matters for us is the fact that uh, we have a momentum integral over something which doesn't depend on the momentum. And therefore, it is zero. Okay. And the important outcome we have already stressed in the morning, namely it means that we have, for example, proven that the photon self-energy in QED in dimensional regularization is transverse at all orders. And also the Dyson-Schwinger equation in D dimensions are valid at all orders and similar identities can also be proven for other theories. Now we enter, of course, the topic of young mills theories, which is maybe one of the most exciting topics of quantum field theory. young mills theories represent some of the most beautiful theories in physics, and maybe one of the most beautiful mathematical frameworks. One of the most profound insights of 20th century physics and one of the greatest successes in theory because we have understood uh, in the last 50, 60, 70 years that all the fundamental interactions between elementary particles are described by this kind of Young-Mills theories that includes the electromagnetic force, the strong force and the weak force. There is a common underlying principle, the gauge principle of Young-Mills theories behind all these interactions. The gauge principle is a very um, deep 
um, mathematical and physical theoretical principle, which is even similar to the principle of coordinate invariance in general relativity. So there is a profound analogy between Young-Mills and general relativity, such that you can even say we have learned that all four fundamental forces, including gravity, are described by one uniform point of view. And uh, those Young-Mills theories are, of course, a generalization of QED, but with some slight, very important modifications. They include QED as a special case, but as a particularly simple case. Uh, Young Mills stands for non abelian gauge theory. So these are gauge theories which generalize the principle of local gauge invariance from an abelian group like U1 in QED to non abelian groups. And as you know, in the standard model of particle physics, we have the group SU3 cross SU2 cross U1, which is a, a group consisting of several factors. That uh, brings us to the notion of simple groups. We will consider here only so-called simple groups, which is a group like SU2 or SU3, which does not factorize into several distinct factors. And there are certain simplifications which follow from this, as we will discuss at least in the exercise and maybe also in the lecture. And uh, we will not discuss too much of the physics here of Young-Mills theories, because that is the point of the other lecture, the parallel lecture on the standard model and standard model physics, where you also learn a lot about the necessary group theory for Young-Mills theories and for non-abelian gauge theories. I will be quite brief here, but we will focus on the quantization and renormalization of these theories. So let's say the focus here is in particular quantization and perturbative renormalization. Using the BRST formalism. which also is one of these really beautiful formalisms. OK, mm, let us begin. Let us begin with classical Young-Mills theories. And as I said, I will be very brief, brief here unless you interrupt me and ask questions, but otherwise I will try to be as brief as possible. And I refer you to uh, either the literature or to the standard model lecture for more details. Let us, however, spell out two motivations for Young-Mills theories, which connect to our quantum field theory one lecture. Uh, that was section four one, where I motivated QED in two ways. And let us recap the two motivations and apply them to motivating Young-Mills theories. Motivation one. The first motivation uh, for QED came from our discussion of free fields and free particles in quantum field theory, in particular um, from the discussion of uh, massless spin one particles. Free field consistency. Namely, what did we find? We considered a free massless spin one particle. And a field. And there was a mismatch. There was a mismatch in the number of degrees of freedom or the number of components. Because the analysis of the Poincaré algebra on the one hand showed that a massless spin one particle has two degrees of freedom, namely the two transverse polarizations, left-handed or right-handed. Uh, or helicity plus one or minus one are the two possible degrees of freedom of a massless uh, photon. 
or generally massless spin one particle, but uh, a free field describing the photon, like an a mu field operator has four components, and so there is a mismatch of two versus four degrees of freedom, uh, and uh, this is the core of some problems, like some degrees of freedom in the field operator must be unphysical. And uh, there are many different ways how to deal with this, but each way uh, leads to difficulties in the quantization procedure which need to be solved and which lead to specific necessi uh, necessities for the forms of possible interactions. So uh, let us focus here. Um, we did more details in the last semester, but let us remind ourselves here of the covariant um, approach. Uh, so the massless particle has two uh, particles degrees of freedom versus four components of a covariant field operator, a hat mu of x. So here I just write a hat to highlight that I'm talking about an operator. And by covariant I mean that there is a representation of Poincaré transformations on the operators, and if you uh, apply this representation of Poincaré onto that field operator, it transforms like a four vector field. So all four components participate in the Poincaré transformations, which makes it covariant. But then we have too many degrees of freedom, and that is reflected in the fact that this free field operator contains creation operators for four different degrees of freedom. And uh, in one approach, we call them 1, 2, S, and L. 1, 2 are the two different transverse degrees of freedom, which are physical. And those two uh, are unphysical. S stands for a scalar. It transforms like a scalar field and would uh, behave like a spin zero um, particle. And L stands for longitudinal, so it contributes a part to a mu, which is proportional to the momentum in momentum space. But both of them are unphysical. They do not correspond to anything which uh, the uh, physical photon has. And uh, the unphysical nature is reflected in indefinite and negative norm of the states in our quantum state space. The indefinite negative norm. So, and the negative norm shows you that you cannot take literally the states that are defined by those operators. Uh, they must be unphysical, otherwise there is no uh, physical interpretation of the resulting quantum theory. And uh, before going to interactions, one could define the so-called Gupta-Bloider method, a physical Hilbert space, as a space of equivalence classes. H-physical was defined as a certain physical subspace, which was defined in some way. Uh, and then divided by another space, which we called Vs. And uh, that notation should just remind you that it was necessary to define a space of equivalence classes. And there was an equivalence class relationship that was defined via that space and a certain physical criterion which defined this space. And the definition went via this operator, A dagger of S, for the scalar degree of freedom um, in this representation of the field operator. So, and then once we want to go to interactions, there is the question of consistency. If you want to have interactions which are consistent with this picture, the interactions should not ruin uh, the interpretation of physical equivalence classes, for example, what must not happen is that you start a scattering process with uh, physical degrees of freedom and there is a certain probability of finding in the final state an unphysical negative norm state. 
Uh, this consistency requires then, uh, for example, that uh, the interaction Hamiltonian or interaction Lagrangian is defined in a consistent way on this physical Hilbert space, which means it should not lead out of the physical subspace and uh, states which are equivalent remain equivalent under the interaction. So, and uh, so that, uh, for example, uh, one option which uh, we showed to work and which we highlighted in the last semester was that whenever you define an interaction Lagrangian, L int as this, that uh, the field operator interacts with something else, with a current, then if this commutator vanishes, then the interaction is consistent with the interpretation of the equivalence classes. Okay? And that is basically achieved if the current is conserved. So, uh, was then uh, you see that uh, the commutation relation holds. And uh, that shows you that in order to keep the interpretation of the physical versus unphysical degrees of freedom, you need to couple a massless spin one particle to a conserved current. In other words, you need a gauge invariant interaction. That was one, one motivation for a QED. And now you can ask yourself, is that really the only option or are there more general possibilities than writing the interaction in this way where you have a linear expression in the photon field times something else which is independent of the photon? Are there more general options? That is one question that you can ask and in particular you see here that uh, in our approach, this d mu a mu, the scalar part of the photon field, commuted with the interaction. So this behaves like a non-interacting field. So what happens if you want that d mu a mu actually interacts? What if d mu a mu should interact? These are two questions which are obvious and these questions of course give rise to a more general approach which will include non-abelian gauge theories where d mu a mu must interact. Let us also remind ourselves of the second motivation. which was geometrical and uh, which is really the beautiful motivation of gauge theories which you find in most textbooks and also which was used historically to actually invent Young-Mills theories in the first place. That was exactly the point. And uh, so for QED we looked at uh, geometry which for QED can be expressed in this way. Let's imagine here that is space-time space-time, some coordinate system in space-time and at each space-time point, for example here you can define a field like uh, the electron field Psi of X, Psi of X and uh, Psi of X is a complex number. So let's imagine complex numbers in terms of these uh, pointer diagrams. So this would be a complex number here and here you might have another field Psi of x plus dx, uh, you, you go to a slightly shifted space-time position and here the field uh, or the wave function has a different complex number pointing like that. And then you can ask yourself, can I have a localized coordinate system with respect to those complex number valued fields Psi of x? If you want that, then uh, you cannot immediately compare this uh, complex number with that complex number because maybe by going from here to there the complex coordinate system has changed a little bit. 
and therefore you need to introduce the notion of parallel transport and then you need to parallel transport this thing here to um, sorry of x plus dx to here and then you would end up maybe with this object here which is the result of parallel transporting psi parallel at x plus dx coming from this position and uh, the parallel transport represents physically the same um, field value but expressed in potentially a different coordinate system therefore the complex number associated with a parallel transported psi might be different from the complex number at the original position but it means the same thing just expressed in a different coordinate system and then you can in a meaningful way compare this uh, field at a, this position with a parallel transported field at the same position. So you introduce uh, localized coordinates for your meta fields and in order to do that you need uh, in mathematical language a connection field which is in physics terms the gauge field a mu of x you need the notion of parallel transport and uh, equivalently the notion of covariant derivatives which are derivatives uh, 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 taking into account parallel transport basically and uh, in QED the covariant derivative is simply the normal derivative plus a prefactor times the gauge field or the connection field and uh, then you can ask yourself is this uh, localized coordinate system actually something physical something necessary or is it just a uh, your luxury or uh, you do it just for fun. Uh, in other words, can you get rid of this localized coordinate system and can you get rid of the connection fields? And the answer to this is lies in curvature. So there is the notion of curvature. If this geometry is curved, you cannot globally uh, go back to the case without any connection fields and the curvature is expressed by the commutator of covariant derivatives and that gives rise to the curvature tensor in physics terms the field strength tensor which is defined as this times the commutator of two covariant derivatives. All right and that is a very beautiful idea. It motivates QED and it has a beautiful analog in general relativity. Where we of course have a general coordinate invariance and the physical uh, part of this general coordinate invariance is that we might also have curvature of space time so uh, everything here has an analog, namely the analog to the connection field are the Christoffel symbols. Gamma, rho, sigma, mu, which define parallel transport from one point to the next. And uh, then you can define parallel transport, you can define covariant derivatives and so on. And you can also define uh, the Riemann curvature tensor via the commutator of two covariant derivatives which is basically the commutator of Christoffel symbols and uh, so I will just write down how it is called R rho sigma mu nu and it is uh, quite analog to the field strength tensor in QED. So that is how we motivated QED in, in a second step and uh, this was of course historically also known and uh, not, uh, also the analogy was known and therefore Young-Mills theories were invented as a generalization of QED where this geometric idea was put uh, to the forefront and very frequently in history Young-Mills theories were actually studied as a toy model for general relativity. 
So also the quantization of Young-Mills theories was discussed by Feynman because he wanted to practice the quantization of uh, gravity. Um, but now we know, of course, that Young-Mills theories are very important for particle physics. And so their quantization is not only useful as a toy model for gravity, but also by itself. Anyway, so these are the two motivations. And uh, OK, here the motivation is now uh, the generalization to multiplets of fields. And uh, where uh, the, the instead of a complex number, you, you, you have a multiplet of fields. And instead of a, a phase transformation, you have a transformation according to some matrix group. OK, so two motivations. And let us do what the motivations lead us to. And as I said before, now I want to be as brief as possible. But please feel free to interrupt me in case there are some questions. But the building blocks I am now going to write down are probably something that you have seen already many times in various lectures and contexts. And they are perfectly standard. So uh, the original Young Mills uh, people started from the geometry motivation. And we will also do that because in this way, we will immediately get all the um, fundamental building blocks which define Young-Mills theories. So we start with the gauge group. The gauge group is a Lie group, which then defines a Lie algebra. Uh, we assume a simple group so the Lie group for us is defined by structure constants f a b c which are totally anti-symmetric and by abstract generators, which I call small ta, and by the commutation relation ta tb is equal to i times f a b c times tc. And for us, there is no difference between writing the group indices at the top or at the bottom. There is no metric tensor to pull them up or down. I will freely write them uh, uh, at the top or at the bottom, uh, depending on what I like to do. <coughs> then abstract group elements, at least close to the identity. can be obtained by exponentiation. So a group element which uh, depends on a continuous set of real parameters theta is obtained by e to the i theta a t a, where theta a are real parameters. So, and there is a certain number of generators uh, and a certain number, of course, the same number of real parameters which define the group elements. And uh, then you could speak of a Lie group of a certain dimensionality, which is the number of these generators. So, that is the first thing, the group. And the second element of gauge theories are the matter fields. So 
So there are a certain set of meta fields which can be speed or fields or scalar fields, but not vector fields. And collectively I call them phi i of x. And for those meta fields we need to define a meta representation of the gauge group, namely a representation, I will call it capital T A. Capital T A are now concrete matrices on the space of these fields phi i. So let's say if you have 10 different meta fields, then you should have here 10 by 10 matrices and so on. And uh, they are a, a representation of the Lie algebra, which means that they satisfy the same commutational relations as the abstract generators with the same structure constants. Once you have defined this representation, we can speak of a gauge transformation of the meta fields, which looks like the following. Phi i goes to phi prime i, which is given by a matrix representation um, u of theta i j times phi j, which is uh, at first order in the transformation parameters given by the unit matrix um, plus i theta a t a i j phi j. Then we can define a covariant derivative d mu. For me in the general case is always defined like this, normal derivative plus i times g times uh, a mu, uh, okay, like this, where this is an abbreviation for the following, a, a mu t a. So I write uh, our gauge field either as a matrix, this a without a gauge group index is a matrix in the space of the fields, uh, but you can expand this in this form, a, a mu times t a contracted over the group index a. So one real gauge field A, A mu for each generator. There are as many gauge fields as there are group generators um, and you can combine them into a matrix valued gauge field by contracting with the generators. This gives the covariant derivative. And then we require the following property. Namely, we require that the covariant derivative of a meta field transforms covariantly. In other words, it transforms in the same way as the original meta field. So we require the following d mu phi with index i transforms under gauge transformations into u of theta ij times d mu phi j. This is our requirement. And so this requirement fixes how the gauge field actually has to transform. 
So this is equivalent to the following transformation of the gauge field. Namely, a mu transforms as follows. A mu goes into a prime mu with the following property that a prime mu is equal to the following. Uh, the original a mu plus, uh, now I need to translate my own notes into something else uh, because obviously I accidentally omitted a factor of the gauge coupling here. So uh, theta uh, bar is now defined as minus g times theta bar is equal to theta. And then my notes talk about theta bar. So let's write it down. A mu plus d mu theta bar minus i times g times the commutator of theta bar times a mu. Or if you want the formula in terms of the theta that I have introduced, it would be a mu plus minus 1 over g d mu theta plus i times the commutator of theta with a mu. And here also I use the same abbreviation for theta without a gauge group index is the contraction of theta a with the generators t a. So for all these objects with a gauge group index, uh, we can do such a contraction and obtain a matrix valued object. And uh, what I always stress is that you should not really memorize too much this gauge transformation of the gauge field because that is the most complicated one. What you must memorize, however, is the gauge transformation of the covariant derivative because that is the point. That is the point. And you can always reconstruct this inhomogeneous transformation from that requirement and that is the essence of gauge theories here. Of course, what you should memorize of this is the structure. Namely, it generalizes ordinary, um, ordinary QED gauge transformations where a mu goes into itself plus a derivative of theta. But here we have something else, which is the commutator because of the non-abelian nature of the gauge group. Yes. Maybe it's best to answer this in a literal sense. So what this means uh, in more explicit form would be the following. So that is theta a times t a and that is a mu b times t b. Okay. And uh, so this is a matrix, uh, let's say Let's say in, in the case of QCD, in the case of QCD, you know QCD, right? Uh, where we have three colors of quarks. And then this thing here would be a so-called Gelman matrix, three by three matrices. So this would be a three by three matrix that are also three by three matrices. So what you have here is a commutator between two three by three matrices. And uh, these are real numbers. These are for every mu, these are also real numbers. So uh, just as an exercise, this would be the same as the following. You can pull out the real number out of the commutator and you all can also pull out the other real number out of the commutator and then what you end up with is that this is equal to that. Okay, Maybe that answers your question a little bit and then you could, for example, go on and say, ah, okay, but this commutator is known because that is the Lie algebra. So we get this 
times I times F A B C T C. And uh, then you have, in some sense, computed that commutator. At least you have rewritten it in a different way in terms of a linear expression in terms of the generators. And so, for example, this sort of calculation is actually of interest because maybe you want to know uh, what is the transformation of one concrete component A prime mu A. How do you get that? You would get it from this calculation because now we can relabel the indices. Let's relabel the indices. Let's swap the names of A and C. I just swap the name A and C of the indices, which are summed over. Okay. And then you see that I have calculated this commutator to something which is the generator TA times a real number, or times a number, sorry, TA times a number. And then I can express the entire equation here as TA times numbers, and I can read off always the coefficients of the TA, and then uh, since the TAs are linearly independent, the equation must be valid for all the coefficients of the TAs, and then I would obtain from this that one component gauge transforms in the following way, this is the original thing. Here I can trivially do it, 1 over g times d mu theta a. And then i times that gives minus uh, f c b a times theta c a mu b. That's it. Uh, OK, he's still there. OK, then we have evaluated the gate transformation of one component of the A's. Uh, this is how such relationships work. Does that answer your question or help at least? OK. And actually, I wanted not to discuss too many of such calculations here, but uh, they are important um, to master. So you must be able to do such calculations. And on the exercise sheet, you will have lots of opportunities to do that. By the way, there is a new exercise sheet on the Opal page. Please look at it and uh, solve it. It contains lots of stuff like this here. So in case there is something unclear, feel free to ask, and we can discuss it in more detail now. OK, what else? Ah, OK, then, of course, the next step is the field strength. The field strength tensor is geometrically the curvature tensor, f mu nu, and is defined by the commutator of two covariant derivatives, 1 over ig times the commutator d mu with d nu. And you can also, this is also matrix valued in this same sense, you, so you can also write it f a mu nu times T A. And you can evaluate it. And then you see that uh, F mu nu without index is equal to the following D mu A nu minus D nu A mu, like in QED, and then plus I times G times the commutator of two gauge fields. And this commutator might be non-zero if the gauge group is non-abelian, if the structure constants are non-zero. And uh, you can do a calculation like this one here to extract the value of individual fa mu nu. For each generator, there is such a field strength. And then this would be given as d mu a a nu minus d nu a a mu minus g f a b c times a b mu a c nu. OK, and I wanted to simply write a small summary of the gauge transformations. So the gauge transformations are phi as a multiplet goes into u phi 
d mu phi goes into u times d mu phi, all in a mult matrix uh, valued sort of way. And f mu nu goes into u times f mu nu times u to the minus 1. Why? Because of the behavior of the covariant derivatives. Each covariant derivative uh, transforms with a u, and therefore f mu nu inherits the simple transformation law. So f mu nu in a non-abelian theory is not invariant uh, in contrast to QED because it has a non-trivial transformation. Um, but in the case where the group is abelian, so the order of the operators doesn't matter, you could write u times u to the minus 1, it cancels, and then it's gauge invariant. So in an abelian group, the field strength tensor is gauge invariant. In a non-abelian group, it is gauge covariant, because it covariantly transforms just like the matter fields. And this is maybe the thing that you should definitely know by heart. Everything else can be reconstructed from it. OK, so we do not have so much more time. But I think we have enough time to write down the Lagrangian. So with all these building blocks and their properties, we can now write down a gauge invariant Lagrangian, which consists of two parts, namely a gauge part plus a matter part. The gauge part depends only on the gauge field and its derivatives. The matter part depends on the matter field and its derivatives in the following way. Namely, the gauge part or the gauge kinetic term contains in particular derivatives of the gauge fields and they are localized in the field strength tensor. And uh, a gauge invariant combination of the field strength tensor in general is this, the trace of f mu nu, f mu nu. Why trace? First of all, the trace gives a number valued result, uh, whereas the field strength is a matrix, first of all. And then in the trace, the u and u to the minus 1 drops out because of the cyclicity of the trace. Therefore, this is manifestly gauge invariant, but it's also a very compact way to write it down. But uh, often, and in particular here, one uses the convention that the trace of a product of two generators, Ta, Tb, is normalized to 1 half Kronecker delta Ab. And then if you do a similar calculation as before, so you replace uh, the matrix value thing by the number valued field strength tensors, then uh, this simply becomes minus 1 over 4 times Fa mu nu times Fa mu nu summed over A. And then you see that for each group generator A, there is one uh, number valued field strength tensor which behaves in the same way as the QED field strength tensor. And so it's a direct generalization of QED. And it's manifestly gauge invariant also for the non-abelian case. Then the meta field Lagrangian is uh, simply any combination of the matter fields and their covariant derivatives, which is Lorentz invariant and globally gauge invariant. Then, because the covariant derivatives behaves covariantly, it is automatically also locally gauge invariant. And what exactly you should write down depends on the case. For spinors, the Lagrangians look differently than for scalar fields. But always, you need to write down something Lorentz invariant. So let's say, for example, for spinor fields, uh, 
uh, it might look like this, that this meta Lagrangian L meta is equal to psi i bar times i gamma mu covariant derivative of psi with overall index i. That would be the quark part of the QCD Lagrangian. Okay, so this is the Lagrangian. Let's highlight this. And uh, let me maybe just make one final remark in order to connect it to the motivation. Namely, let us look at the equation of motion on the classical level, the Euler-Lagrange equation of motion. What is the equation of motion? By just taking uh, this gauge part of the Lagrangian without meta part. If you take just the gauge part, then uh, what you get from the Euler-Lagrange equation of motion is a set of terms, so from the Euler-Lagrange variation of just this f mu nu, f mu nu. f mu nu is complicated, as you know. I mean, do you know it? That this f mu nu contains, of course, products of fields as well, so it's not linear, it uh, contains quadratic terms. Uh, you know it, right? Uh, okay, maybe not everybody. Okay, anyway, um, let me first uh, do the calculation, then we might comment on that more. But uh, the f mu is a complicated uh, combination of the uh, uh, gauge fields uh, because of this term here or because of that term here. It contains bilinear terms in the gauge field. So if you do Euler-Lagrange, you get complicated equations. But what you really get is uh, just this one, d mu f mu nu is zero where d mu here in this case is defined in the adjoint representation. And so let me uh, use the remaining time to define the adjoint representation. In the adjoint representation, the generators, there are specific versions of the generators in the adjoint representation, which I call TA adjoint representation with indices ij. And they are given by specific matrices, namely by the structure constants minus i times f a i j. So of course, the structure constants define matrices like that. Okay. You take the three indices with different meanings. The first index is now used as the index labeling which generator are you talking about. And the remaining two indices are used as the matrix indices. And then in this way, you define lots of matrices. And the number of matrices is the same as the dimensionality of each matrix. That is what you do here. And the point is that uh, magically, but it's not magic, but it's uh, systematic, that they satisfy the same commutation relations. Namely, the commutator of this defined in this way, TA adjoint times Tb, a joint commutator, is equal to i times fabc times t a joint c. And uh, that simply follows from the Jacobi identity of the structure constants. So that's fundamentally true for any gauge group. And uh, so then you can always define a covariant derivative in the adjoint representation. The covariant derivative is always defined with uh, depending on some generator, and here you need to plug in the uh, joint generator. So in more explicit terms, that would now be the following. Um, let's say if we want to evaluate the term with the gauge group index A from this, what would we need to do? We would need to do the following. Covariant derivative is generally this, d mu plus i times g 
times the generator, in this case from the adjoint representation, uh, uh, let's say index C, A, C, mu, acting on the object which we are talking about. Then the object here has a certain color index and uh, the covariant derivative basically is a matrix in uh, the color space with open index A. So now we have to do A, B and here index B. That would be the definition. And then you see what uh, emerges is this thing. Here you need the adjoint representation with color label C and matrix index A, B. And that is what I have defined here with relabeled indices. So this is an explicit expression. And what does this expression contain? This expression contains, of course, the equation of motion for all the fields. And one term in the expression is simply the one from QED. So this F mu nu contains, among many other terms, D mu A nu. But it also contains much else but it contains, for example, that. And then there will be one term in the expression which looks like d'Alembert A nu equals something. So you get an equation of motion for d'Alembert uh, of the gauge fields, but you see that the equation of motion contains lots of stuff on the, on the right-hand side of the equation. So the equation of motion for A mu is not just d'Alembert A mu equals zero, like for a free field, but it's a very complicated nonlinear equation of motion. And even that remains the case if you now hit this with another derivative. So, uh, okay, that has just one line of space. Take another derivative of the same equation, d nu of the same equation. If you do that, then you will generate one term, d'Alembert, d nu a nu. So you will get zero is equal to d'Alembert, d nu a nu. And that would be the equation of motion for the scalar part of the photon field, which uh, was important in the gupta bleuler method that we discussed in one of the motivations. Namely there, d nu a nu had to be a free field. It had to commute with the interactions. And now we see here the equation of motion for d nu a nu. D'Alembert d nu a mu is not zero, like it would be for a free field, but it contains lots of terms plus lots of terms, including terms with up to three powers of A. So this uh, object here satisfies a very complicated equation of motion, and therefore this is not a free field and does not commute with the interaction. And so you see that we are in one of these more general cases which are not covered by our analysis of quantum field theory one. The structure of interactions implied by the Young-Mills setup is different and more complicated than the one of QED. And therefore, in the quantization, which is what we discussed in the last semester, we need to work a little bit harder. And unfortunately, time is up. Therefore, this hard work will have to be done next week. But uh, that will give rise to uh, the so-called BRST formalism, which is an extremely elegant formalism to treat uh, all these problems connected to the quantization. And we already alluded to it in the context of the last semester in one exercise sheet where I showed you that this gupta bleuler method can be regarded as a special case, a simple case of this BRST formalism. And once you understand this connection, then the BRST formalism basically remains the same and it completely covers the situation. Okay, so let us stop here and then um, see you next week.